Okay. Well, today, and we were supposed to do this last week, but we're going to be looking at Joseph and Potiphar's wife. And Potiphar, and this is in Genesis 39, the chapter 39, we'll go through the whole chapter, but we will be looking at some of the prelude to how Joseph got to where he is when it picks up at verse 1 of chapter 39. Now, Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. We want to go up and look a little bit about what he had been doing before. So now we have the uh, issue here. The, the title of this lesson is Potiphar's Wife, the Board. And that's not the chairman of the board. That's somebody who is bored. Now, what can happen there? How many of you as parents had children tell you, I'm bored? No. Nobody? Nobody? <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 That's before we had computers. Yeah. Yeah. People with computers, <laughs> I'm bored. <laughs> Students, I'm, this is a boring class. You can drop that. Well, here's, here's a drop slip. You said Genesis, what, 39? What's that? Genesis 29? 39. 39? Yes, sir. I'm sorry. No, you said the right one. Well, I said the right number. Well, I'm glad. <laughs> but um, just a couple of things. Henry David Thoreau said, the devil finds work for idle hands. Think about that. You're idle, you're bored. He'll find something to fill the, fill the gap there for it. Benjamin Franklin said, idle hands are the devil's playthings. Now, some of us heard, idle hands are the devil's <laughs> playground. Or a workshop. He will fill the gap. And that's what we see with uh, Potiphar's wife. And interestingly enough, she is not named. And that sometimes in Scripture is a signal that we don't want to emphasize her as much as the lesson there. It's not as important who she, uh, what her name was, but who, what her position was. Now we see, as we recall, Joseph, as he was growing up, was uh, despised by his brothers. Because he was uh, his father's favorite. Father gave him a coat of many colors. And that singled him out. They did not like him. They called him the dreamer. Because he had the dream about they're all going to be bowing down to him. And that really added to their distaste for him. So we also know that uh, at, there was a day where his brothers were out uh, in the fields. Or were out somewhere. And he went to them. And they decided, as they saw the dreamer approaching, that they were going to kill him. Now, that's a pretty extreme uh, punishment or uh, an extreme evidence of their dislike, how deep it was, how deep that contempt was. And they plotted to kill him, but they decided not to. He was down in a cistern, um, and uh, along came some Ish Ishmaelites who were headed to Egypt, and they bought him. So the brothers didn't kill him. They sold him into slavery. And of course the story at that point ends with the coat of many colors having animal blood on it. Taken to Jacob. Oh, father, father, Joseph must be dead. He must have been ravaged by an animal or something. And of course Jacob, it really it gets to him because he was his favorite. He was one of his sons, but he was his favorite of the sons. So now we open at verse uh, chapter 39, verse 1. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian, who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites, who had taken him there. <clears throat> now the important thing about this is Potiphar is not just an ordinary person. He is one of Pharaoh's officials. And that is important because it tells us about the lifestyle of Mrs. Potiphar. She was a privileged person. And we're going to see she had to do very little. And there were no soap operas on TV in Egypt at that time to watch. And there were no service clubs apparently to belong to because she spent the time in the house. And her needs were met. How many of you watched out Abbey? Okay, I'm okay. Oh, yeah, I noticed that. Look. Put it oh, no, I don't want to be identified with that. But when you, those of us who watched it, and I was addicted to it, I think it was one of the best programs, one of the best uh, series. 
series they've ever produced. <coughs> what it showed us was how the rich and, and the uh, privileged in England didn't even dress themselves. There was always somebody there to do it. And that's what is, is the situation here with Potiphar's household. He was the captain of the guard, and that's uh, some of the people who have reviewed this, scholars who have reviewed it, said that could be one of two things. It could be that he was in charge of the prison, and this is going to become important later on. Uh, the prison and, um, and the house, imagine this, the prison may have been attached to the house. How would you like to be the warden and you have the prison attached? Yeah, that's a good idea. But... Or another thing, he could have been uh, sort of the secret service for Potiphar, the guard in charge of the guard in either of them. He was very important. So that makes her very important and very privileged. The Lord was with Joseph, so he prospered and lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him, what, are, what does that mean? How does how does Potiphar? Because he's not he's not Jewish. He's Egyptian, and he is not um, practicing the same religion. That he does not have the same God as as Joseph does. We remember from um, the uh, ten plagues that those were all all the plagues dealt with the gods of Egypt. They had multiple gods, including Pharaoh as the top god. So. What, what what did Joseph do? He, he, he made an impression on Potiphar. And it was a powerful, positive impression. Not just a, oh yeah, the kid's a pretty good guy and knows how to run a household. It was, there's something different about it. There is something very different about it. I just wonder if Potiphar recognized that in his mind, one of the Egyptian gods, if this were written from the Egyptian perspective, would they have said, you know, they wouldn't have recognized necessarily God, but they're thinking everything goes right with them. God must be favored. Okay. Yeah. Don't know for sure. Good point. No. Sure don't. <clears throat> and because it says that the Lord gave him, him being Joseph's success and everything he did. I mean, he did it flawlessly, and that was that was uh, of interest there. Joseph found favor in his eyes, Potiphar's eyes, and became his attendant. He was not only in the house; he was Potiphar's attendant. So Mrs. Potiphar would have seen a lot of him just in in those duties, but he was over the entire household as well. Um, Potiphar put him in charge of the um, of his household, and he entrusted his care in, uh, entrusted to his care uh, everything he owned. Now Potiphar put a lot of responsibility on Joseph, and he wasn't that old. Remember, he's a young, he's a young, pretty much young when he's kidnapped. So we're not talking about a century later or twenty years later. He becomes the household, the head of the household. He's a pretty young guy. But he, he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, owed, owned. So it was real cold last week, so I think I'm afraid. <laughs> Not only did I have a rupture in there, but I had a rupture somewhere else. He entrusted e everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian. So not only was Joseph blessed, but Potiphar was blessed. <clears throat> the, um, because of Joseph, the blessing of the Lord on everything was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So not only is the household running smoothly, but his fields are producing. Uh, <coughs> there was probably a, a difference in the slaves. The Egyptians, the Egyptians were, were interesting people. The Hebrew slaves generally worked in the homes, in the houses. The Egyptian slaves, those probably 
who had been convicted or were um, <coughs> or were, of course, most of those convicted of crimes were executed, so they didn't have a large group there. But those who were Egyptian slaves worked the fields. That's kind of different. They gave the Egyptians gave the Egyptians the worst jobs and kept the good jobs for their their foreign uh, slaves. So anyway, both the household and the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. But Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything. He knew Joseph had it under control, with the exception of one, one thing. The food he ate. The food he ate. Now, why was that? Didn't trust him to prepare it right? Egyptians don't eat with Hebrews. So the food is going to be, it's kind of, I would say it's off the table. No, it's actually on the table, but it's off as far as what Joseph had responsibility for. And Joseph may have been a lousy cook. No, that's not the inference we should draw from it. It's just, it's basically a cultural thing. So it's like Daniel was with his captors. That's right. He said, well, we need to meet and the rich stuff that they right. They like to eat. Yes, and that's that's a good, very good point. And of course, Pot, uh, Potiphar and Joseph would never have eaten together because that would have been a cultural no no, even as good as Joseph was. And we all know that our, our Down Abbey fans, <laughs> two of us here in this room, know that the uh, know that the uh, where did the servants eat in the basement? Yeah, thank you very much. Oh, the <laughs> castle. So, all right. You didn't think you were going to get to know something like that, did you? Oh, you probably did. You probably said that jerk comes up with the most <laughs> off the wall stuff I've ever heard. But anyway, what would you call me then? I don't know. I don't know. I'll think about it. I'll come up with something. Yeah. If you just just let me know between now and quarter after, we got a half hour to come up with something. <laughs> yeah, probably not. You got to research and uh, delete most of it. You'd say, well, I can't say that in church. <laughs> All right. So we have, we have, everything is going swimmingly here. And this is a study of Mrs. Potiphar, not Joseph. But we have to see where Joseph fits in all of this in order to understand uh, Mrs. Potiphar. And Mrs. Potiphar is fairly, not fairly, she, she has very little to do. She doesn't care for herself, really. She's got servants and slaves to do this. She's got a lot of time on her hands, on her, her hands. We know that sometime when we don't, I've got nothing to do. The mind does not think necessarily in the right direction as to what we ought to do. And in her case, it certainly didn't. So now, we get to this point where uh, there at um, the end of verse 6, now Joseph was well built and handsome. And some of the commentators say this is very interesting because usually in Scripture, people who are named are not described physically, unless it's necessary. We know how big Goliath was. Well, it was necessary because that was what was going to, that's what was going to bring David to fame, was killing this giant. We talked about, a few weeks ago, we talked about the giants in the land of uh, milk and honey. They were described as that, but not details. But in this, he is well-built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. Now, what does after a while indicate? Some time had passed, but not necessarily years. Some time had passed, and she had been doing what? Nothing. Nothing, and she had been looking at... There you go. And she, and this, and... I mean, he is in the house. He lives in the house. She is in the house. She lives in the house. She's been doing, she had plenty of time to do it. Now, it certainly wasn't years, but just in a week or two or a month or several months. 
They've been together quite a bit. And she was doing this observation. And come to bed with me. She didn't say, Joseph, have you ever played chess before? <laughs> Would you like to pay, play 21? Or get a cup of coffee. Yeah, or get a cup of coffee. Or a cup of whatever they drank. I don't know. Mm -hmm. the Egyptians have coffee, don't they? I know. I've never known an Egyptian. So but when she said, come to bed with me, was she giving him an order? Yeah, basically. Be. She's, well, used she, to, she's used to dealing with slaves. Yeah. And do what she wants her to do. You will do this for me. You'll do this. You'll do this. You'll right. do this. But I'm a different more than passing board. Oh, yeah. It yeah. probably yeah. was. Yeah. And and the one thing, and uh, Dewey talked about this during the prep class, we really, <laughs> and this is going to be tough to talk about, we really <laughs> don't know what she looked like. Okay? Probably pretty challenging. Well, she could be, or she could be not so good looking. I bet she was young. You think? Yeah. You, you want to bet? You can't bet in the <laughs> building. Well, we can go on the parking lot. I, guys, I, I, I have a theory that guys marry up to a potter for a great guy. You were probably pretty shiny. <laughs> and by shiny, you mean what? No, we can't do that. Uh, no, we're not going to. Okay. <laughs> We'll delete that. Edit. You guys are the editor back there. And if guys don't think that they marry up, look at your wife. No? Yeah. Ooh, that was a smooth I've memory. always had that. <laughs> guys marry up. So he probably did. He may have. And Charlotte's not even here to hear that. Yeah. No, I'll tell her. Oh, she knows. She knows. She knows. She married up. Oh, well, yeah, let's, okay, we'll leave that subject. <laughs> Moving right along before anybody else gets in trouble. We will just move along. All right, now what did he do? He refused, okay? He did the right thing. Now, if she was a real looker, that would have been tough to do. So let's go with, let's go with the Steve Huddle theory on this. But she was good looking. He refused. He did the right thing in the face of a pretty serious temptation. Now, again, this is not about this. The focus of the lesson is on Potiphar's wife, not on Joseph. But we can still get lessons from that. And what, for those of you who have, uh, uh, did not go to the first service, the second service, the topic in the second service is going to be the sexual issues. And this is one, this is <laughs> one that Dale kind of alludes to, but he doesn't spend a lot of time on it. And then he goes on to say, <clears throat> he doesn't just refuse. He goes on to explain why. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in this house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to me. No one is greater in this house. He's getting a little wound up here. In this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you. So he got it right. This was not just a matter of no, 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 and backing away. He explained Mrs. Potiphar. Now he may have said Mrs. Potiphar, with respect, I'm in charge of this house. I'm in charge of everything. I have dominion over everything except you. Because you are his wife. He recognized this was not the way to go, and she as we're going to see, was unhappy with that decision. Uh, uh, how, and then, then he adds this. This is, this may be some, not this exactly, but he may have conducted himself in, consistent with what he's doing right now, which showed Potiphar just how different and how blessed Joseph was. Because he says, how could you do, how could I do such a wicked thing? He doesn't say, how could I do such a thing? He calls it wicked, because it is. That's his view of it. Very clear. And sin against God. Not against the master. Not against the Pharaoh. But against God. How could I do such a wicked thing? Now that must have really it set her off. Because we're going to see, you all know the uh, story. You know the narrative. But we're going to see it. As, as it unfolds here. And those, uh, she spoke to Joseph day after day. He refused to go to bed with her 
or even be with her. So not only did he refuse, not only did he give the reasons for the refusal, but she then, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump to a conclusion here. She probably thought, this is gonna to be tougher than I thought, but it's gonna be fun. Because now she's gonna pursue him. He rejected her. Now she's going to pursue him. Now the, now the hunt is on. And she's going to get him one way or the other. Now she got him the other way, not the way she thought. But he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. So she, again, she didn't give up. I mean, she was rebuffed, rebuked in a very no, uh, no uh, question about it way. He didn't say, oh, I don't think we ought to do this. He made it very clear this was not going to happen. So now she doesn't, she's not dissuaded. Again, what does that indicate? She's got so much time on her hands. She can play this game. She can do these things. She can go after him and continually go after him and continue to ask him. When he was trying to avoid her, apparently. Yeah, and try, yeah so, it, mm -hmm. so it was even a better hunt in the sense that she had to go find him. On occasion, I'm sure. All right. Any questions or any comments about that so far? We see what the idle, idle hands can be. The uh, bored mind does not go in the best direction. She didn't say, "Well, you know, I could spend some of my um, time that I have here instead of being bored. I could go work if you work for me." Well, well, the longer it took her to is like, you know, how dare a servant rebuff me? Oh, yes. And when she starts talking about it <laughs> later on, we see she's got the claws out. Yeah. All right. Boy, I'm glad this is over in three weeks, two weeks. We have two <laughs> more weeks together, by the way, folks. You got to put up with it. I'm sorry. But then we uh, then we go into the uh, tornado as to the um, Tornado season. We'll probably have a couple of tornado days. I certainly hope not. But the way things have been going, anything is possible at this point. Now, one day he went into the house to attend to his duties. None of the household servants were inside. Now, when I worked in, in prosecution, we would sometimes get what appeared to be a coincidence, but we found generally wasn't a coincidence and I think it was not a coincidence that the house was vacant except for Potiphar's wife and Joseph on this day so, and she again she again can tell even though Joseph is in charge of the household she's the the master's wife she can tell them go outside and do this go do this go do this go do this so the house is empty she caught him by his cloak now, some of the commentators have said, <clears throat> now, to us, what does a cloak mean to us? Okay. Okay. Cape, kind of stuff you wear over <clears throat> something. Some have said maybe, or at that time, a cloak may have been his clothing. Because they didn't, I'm sure because of the, the nice warm weather uh, that, we, uh, that they have in Egypt, uh, they did not necessarily need to dress dress up really warm like we did this last week, and um, so it may have been it may have been grabbed him by the clothes he had on, and that was that cloak. She caught his cloak and said, "Come to bed with me," but he left his cloak in her hand in her hand and ran out of the house. What did Joseph do? He didn't run to the temptation; he ran away from it. He did the right thing, but in doing that, what does he what does he end up doing? Leaving something she can use against him behind. Right? Leaving something she can use against him behind. And number two. Really made him mad. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. She was upset. That's a two two words. Up and set. <laughs> and she was. Because now. She hasn't been able to get him by kind of, hey, come on, let's do this. And then uh, basically come to bed with me, come to sort of an order. And now not, and she grabs him. And not only does, does that work, uh, uh, 
grabs him, he gets out of that and runs away. All right. When she saw that he had left his left uh, his cloak in her hand, I'm sure that that's kind of interesting to think. You know, she looks up. Oh, he left his cloak. I think she probably knew that. But aha! Now I got it right where I want. He doesn't want me. Well, guess what? <clears throat> when she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her household servants. Okay. And remember that she called. That's what it says. Her call. We'll see later on when she reports it to Potiphar how she says it. Look, she said to them, "This Hebrew now see she does this Hebrew has been brought to us to make sport of us. It was all his fault. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. Well, I don't know." When he heard my, me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a great story. Then we get to verse 16, and this is where we see she's building the story against him. She kept his cloak beside her until his master came home. She's, again, boredom leads to this temptation which then leads to what? Revenge. And she and she keeps that cloak. Because she's got the evidence against him. She kept the cloak, his cloak beside her until the master came home. Then she told him this story. And I love the way <clears throat> this is phrased. The he, that Hebrew slave. Okay? He's 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 below the dirt level in, in the society of, of uh, Egypt. That Hebrew slave, you brought us. Okay, Whose fault is this now? Is this Potiphar. Oh, man, if you hadn't brought this slave in here, this Hebrew slave in here, none of this would have happened. We do to take responsibility at all. No. <laughs> no. Saying, this is how your slave, Potiphar, you're at fault here. So she is, she's got a very devious mind. And a lot of that may be this boredom that she had. A lot of time to do things mentally. <clears throat> this is how your slave treated me. And then Potiphar burned with anger. The interesting thing is, Scripture doesn't tell us at whom that anger was burned. It could have been going two ways. To Joseph. But I think Potiphar had a problem with believing his wife on this. May not have been the first time. Probably May not have been the first time. <clears throat> Number two, he thinks the world of all of Joseph. And, and we don't know the time frame here. I don't think it just occurred within a week. I think there was over and over again, he got to see how Joseph handled the household. And Joseph kind of moved up to being overall in the house, except for Potiphar's wife and except for what Potiphar ate. Well, it showed, too, how much trust Potiphar had in him to begin with if he gave him his entire household. I mean, right. There had to be a trust there. Yeah, very deep trust. And Potiphar, as the captain of the guard, if he's dealing with prisoners, is fully well aware there are some people you really can't trust. The old adage of how do you know he was lying? Well, his lips were open. That kind of thing. You don't trust him ever. But then in his household, he saw Joseph. And of course, Joseph, God was with Joseph the whole time this is going on and beyond. But what he did, what he saw was something he really could trust, could really put trust in. And now this happens, and we don't know, as Charles said, we don't know about Mrs. Potiphar. This may not have been the first time this sort of thing has happened. She had already shared this with the servants. Sure. Her anger and yep. 
accusation against Joseph. So it was a scandal, if you will, already. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. It was. Even bigger than Ted Cruz's scandal. <laughs> okay. I imagine that. Edit that. <laughs> All right. Now. He burned with anger, and 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 some of that anger may have been directed at himself. It could have been. I mean, one kind of get off of scripture here a little bit, but he may have recognized Mrs. Potiphar had too much time on her hands, and this may have, as Charles said, happened before, or something similar to it. So he's angry with himself for not controlling that better, and he may be angry with Joseph because did it really happen or didn't it? And I trusted him. You know, he could felt felt betrayed in a way. Um, so that anger, but it, it's interesting that scripture doesn't say his anger burned against. It says he, he burned with anger. Joseph took, uh, Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. Now, what we need to know about the criminal justice system in Egypt is most crimes carry what punishment? Death. Death penalty. This one for sure. So that's a little bit more evidence that Potiphar wasn't quite buying into all of this. Because if he truly believed, if he truly believed this Hebrew slave, he had trusted, he had placed in the household, tried to rape his wife, what would he have done? Killed him. Yeah. He would have had him executed. But he didn't. Put him in the prison. He might have drawn his sword right then and executed him. Yeah, yeah, he would. Have, he could. He could have executed him right on the spot. He might mess up the house, but <laughs> well, he's got a house. He's got slaves. I mean, Down Abbey. If that happened Down Abbey, they clean it up. It wouldn't be Lord Grantham. He wouldn't do that. All right. Oh, oh, and then of course, this is also very interesting. Joseph is in prison. But while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. The Lord continued to be with him. He showed him kindness, the Lord did, and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. Now, the prison warden, for those of you who have either worked in corrections or know people who work in corrections, they can be very, um, I mean, nobody's, nobody tells the truth, everybody's a crook kind of thing. You can get kind of not kind of, you get jaded when you deal with things like that. But he even granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. The prison warden sees this inmate is different from the rest of them. And what did he do? He was made responsible for all that was done there. This is an interesting prison system. You know, the inmates run the institution. You've heard that. Well, he selects Joseph to do this. Um, <coughs> In charge of all the uh, those held in the prisoners were made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care, because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. So the warden recognizes the same things that Potiphar recognized. And later on, we won't go into that in this story, but <clears throat> we know that later on, Pharaoh had great trust in him. He became number two in Egypt. And it was important, uh, that was important because that saved Egypt from the seven years of famine. Because in the seven years of plenty, they built up that, that uh, <coughs> surplus. Okay, now let's look at some of the lessons. There's about five lessons we can learn. We'll go through these very quickly. But number, um, the first lesson we can learn is... Stay alert. Do not let boredom give the devil a foothold. There's an interesting passage in Timothy, and we'll go through this very quickly. First Timothy 5, 13 through 15. Paul is discussing young widows with Timothy in this letter. Besides, he's talked about the young widows. Besides, they get into the habit of being idle and go about from house to house. They not only do not, and not only do they become idlers, but also busybodies. 
who talk nonsense, saying things they ought not to. So I counsel you under widows to marry, to have children, to manage their homes, and to give the enemy no opportunity for slander. Some have, in fact, already turned away out of following Satan. So what he is basically saying here is that idle time, be alert to the fact that the idle time cannot, it may not be a blessing. Some people think, you know, I'm so happy to be home from work, and now I sit back and relax. And, you know, that's not a bad thing to do, but be alert. It can lead to other things. And then surround yourself with support. That's important. That's why uh, Paul says in uh, Ephesians 6, 10, and 11, finally be strong in the Lord and his mighty power, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. That is being active within the church, putting on that armor. And it doesn't have to be at a function in the church. It could be studying, it could be uh, participating in activities uh, that the church has, it could be the blessing center, it could be things of that sort. That will take away that idleness that can lead to difficulties. Um, surround yourself with support. Uh, we also see in Ephesians, Paul writes in Ephesians 4, 13 through 14, uh, until we re all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole message of the fullness of Christ, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves. We now have a strong foundation. We are well founded, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful Scheme. So we've got a problem there. We need we need to be well anchored, if you will. Now, number three, resist indulging boredom in others, not with others, but in others. And one of the things that's kind of interesting here is Amos the prophet, and he was he was one of those guys who really called it like it was. He was saying, Hear this word, you cows of Basham. He's referring to women. <laughs> On Mount Samariah, you women who oppress the poor and crush the needy and say to your husbands, bring us some drinks. Now, what he is, what that is, if you put it in context, what he is, the husband's supposed to tell the wife, no, no, that's not what he said. <laughs> bring me a drink, honey. But um, what he is saying there is, don't use your idle time to do things like this. And he, he, uh, he makes the analogy to the women being cows. Well, what do cows do? They stand out in the field and they eat grass and they wander around and they moo occasionally. Uh, I mean, it, using that and um, using that as the uh, description is not is uh, what he's talking about. Is if you look at cows, they're very idle. They don't do a lot of things. And then in Ephesians 4, 15, and uh, later in verse 25, instead of speaking the truth in love, this is what Paul says when he writes to Ephesus, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is our head, that is Christ. The book of Ephesians and, a lot of, and other works that, that Paul did say we should have the mindset of Christ. We should emulate him. He should be, we realize we cannot reach that perfection, but he should be what we're looking for. Well, how idle was Jesus while he was on this earth? Did he rest? Yes, he did. We know that on the sea he rested. Well, the, the crew was going crazy that they were all going to die. He was resting. He did that. But at the same time, he did not have a lot of idle time. And when he had idle time, or when he had time, what did he do? Pray to God. Yeah. That's the way to fill that void. And also, um, part of this is <clears throat> uh, don't indulge boredom in others. If somebody is bored, we shouldn't put up with that. If somebody's got too much time on their hands, 
that's not a good thing. We should we should not let them do that. Now, sometimes what we have, uh, as Dewey pointed out in the outline, is we may have, um, and I dealt with parents like this. The son is 27 years old. He is a twice convicted felon. But mama is still there to support him. Support is fine. Enabling is not. And that enabling is what she was doing because it was never his fault. Never. The police hate him. They're after him. Yeah, you know, they're after him because he burglarized the business. Yeah, okay. He robbed the bank. Yeah, they're after him. All right, we can agree on that, but there's a reason. And then I had one of them come up to me one time and say, You're at fault here. <laughs> And I didn't even know them. It wasn't even my case. <laughs> but she came up to me and said, you're at fault here because you did nothing to prevent this. Well, I didn't because I didn't even know this. Okay, but the point is, blame others. That is not going to help us. Idleness never affects only the idle. We see this here where the idleness that Mrs. Potiphar had truly affected Joseph. He went to prison. It also affected Potiphar, her husband. If there had been distrust there between him and his wife, it didn't get better. And that boredom that she had, had, it's not just it affects the bored person, it can affect others. And finally, when we stumble, confession beats a cover-up. So if Mrs. Potiphar had just said, you know, you know, Potiphar, I just strayed. I got off the path here. Joseph is really a great looking guy, and I just fell for it. No, what did she say? Uh-uh. No, 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 no. I didn't do it. He did this. The servant you brought did this to me. Okay. All right. Now we've got 30 seconds for comments. <laughs> I've, often, I've often wondered uh, what Potiphar's wife and Potiphar himself thought when Joseph was elevated to second in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would have told us, well, it, it would certainly have confirmed Potiphar's view, and it probably um, would have caused him to review what Mrs. Potiphar told him. I have to say, Joseph was right. Well, you know, just like Adam tried to blame God, I said, this woman you gave me. Yeah. Gave you. yeah. <laughs> she blamed the devil. He blamed her and God. Yeah. So, why are you here, God? There's nothing wrong. We're, we're innocent. And we see way too much of that. All right. Anything else? Next week. Oh, next week.